Cool, we've got a really full house, so uh, either it's Mike or his title um, <laughs> that have drawn everybody in. Mike is, as I say, going to talk to a very interesting title, um, God, Evolution, uh, Global Warming and Heart Disease, a Personal Reflection on, on Population Health. Um, I, I think... Many people in the department will know of Mike's work um, and its impact well beyond Oxford in terms of the focus of his research group on uh, uh, areas of cardiovascular health and increasingly now going beyond cardiovascular health uh, into chronic disease. Uh, and um, uh, in the last year, uh, the group um, became a WHO uh, group uh, looking at um, chronic disease um, prevention. Um, and particularly the area around which I believe um, uh, the university was particularly keen to uh, recognise his contributions were contributions on nutrition, uh, particularly in terms of helping people to make informed choices about uh, nutrition, uh, the kind of traffic lights on food, uh, the nutritional content of food. Um, has had a huge impact both in the UK and beyond in terms of, of providing information uh, to people so they can make choices uh, about uh, nutrition and how that might impact on their health. Um, for that work, not only was he recognised by the university, uh, but also in 2009 he received the Lifetime Achievement Award of the Karen Walker Trust um, for that work and for related work. Uh, so uh, the university has belatedly recognised what others had recognised well before, um, of uh, Mike's work and the contributions that he's made to cardiovascular health. The British Heart Foundation, too, have recognised that work over a long period of time, supporting him and his group uh, in terms of the work in nutrition, the work on other areas, um, uh, not particularly non-drug-related areas to preventing cardiovascular disease, and also in terms of uh, counting the bodies, counting the cardiovascular events, looking at the trends and providing the statistics against which um, policy can be judged. So um, uh, it's a great pleasure on behalf of the Department of Population Health um, and all of the members of the Department of Population Health to uh, have this inaugural lecture by, by Mike. Thank you. Thank you. In general, I think you should never apologise when giving lectures. But I'm going to start this lecture with three apologies. Firstly, I know that it's conventional to give lots of acknowledgements in an inaugural lecture, but I have only two. Firstly, to the University of Oxford, and in particular to Professor Rory Collins for awarding me this professorship. And secondly, to the British Heart Foundation for paying my salary for the last 22 years. There are too many others I should like uh, thanks. So to avoid missing people out, I'll stop there. I'll, however, uh, acknowledge in the course of my lecture some of the people who've um, affected my thinking about population health. Secondly, I also know this convention will try to be inspirational in an inaugural lecture. I'd like to be inspirational but my trajectory from DPhil student in the Department of Zoology in Oxford or, um, more than 20 or 25 years ago, I can't remember, uh, to Professor of Population Health has hardly been conventional, and I would not advise anyone to follow my example. <laughs> so I'm sorry if you come to this lecture hoping to hear some tips on how to become a Professor of Population Health I do, however, hope to inspire you to think differently about population health. My third apology um, is that this lecture is more valedictory than inaugural. Uh, this seems inevitable, given that I've been working in the field of population health now for about 30 years, and by my reckoning, I have less than 10 years left. <laughs> I fought against uh, the consequent temptation to be self-referential, and even worse, self-indulgent, but you'll see that I haven't been able to resist the temptation completely. <laughs> Sorry. So I've chosen as the title for this lecture, God, Evolution, Global Warming and Heart Disease, not because I'm an expert on these four things, but because all four topics have figured extensively in my intellectual life, for a, want of a better term. Much as particular songs 
or pieces of music uh, provide the soundtrack of one's general life. Incidentally, the actual piece of music which has done this for me is uh, Without You by Nilsson. Uh, but don't worry, I'm not going to play you a clip. <laughs> that would be just too self-indulgent. I guess we all have many pieces of music that provide the soundtrack of our lives. And there are many more topics I could have included in this list. Foods and diets being an obvious one, as Roy's just said. These four topics of God, evolution, global warming and heart disease do, I think, have a relationship with population health. And the aim of this lecture is merely to persuade you that they do. It's clearly obvious that heart disease is relevant uh, to population health, but of course um, less so when it comes to God, evolution and global warming. So here are four pictures of God, evolution, global warming and heart disease. Three of these paintings were painted by my friends for, for me, and two of one, I can't, I can't see, one or two of you are here. Top left is a painting of Jesus' miracle of turning water into wine at the wedding at Cana, which hangs in my office here in the department. It depicts God in the shape of an actual living person. I don't know his name, who rep represents Jesus, and that's second from the left. God has always been an important topic in my life, uh, so much so that I became an Anglican priest in 2008, as many of you know. Theologians, I think, have much to say about health. Top right is a painting by Desmond Morris that illustrates the front cover of the first edition of a book called The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins. The Selfish Gene was published in 1976 while I was studying for a degree in zoology here in Oxford. And I had some tutorials with Richard Dawkins. I think I only named it twice, that's one. <laughs> I think the book has been very important in the way that we think about many things, including health, and perhaps even more comparable in its influence to Charles Darwin's The Origin of the Species, published in 1860. I do not think the influence um, of either books has been great. Bottom right is a painting entitled Global Warming, since around the mid-1990s, through meeting an e energy expert called Arlo Mackay, who had worked with um, Niels Bohr in Copenhagen, I think that's my second name drop, I have increasingly come to see that global warming is a much bigger problem than heart disease, and, and almost everything else, I think. And this has had an influence on my perspective on population health, as I'll briefly explain later. Finally, the last painting, painting bottom left, is entitled Heart Disease. Heart disease is a topic that I have been concerned with since 1986 when I joined the staff of a non-governmental organisation called the Coronary Prevention Group. I guess this picture does not make for comfortable viewing, but it reminds us that heart disease isn't, in the end, a comfortable subject. It affects people we know and love, including some of us here. It is an evil that many in this department of population health are seeking to eradicate or at least to ameliorate. This picture obviously has both theological and biological uh, references. The three hooded figures represent, at least to my way of thinking, three of the four horsemen of the apocalypse in the book of Revelation. And the yellow gunge represents the cholesterol-laden plaque that clogs up coronary arteries, thereby causing coronary heart disease. Before moving on to the relationship between God, evolution, global warming and heart and heart disease and population health, I feel a need to provide you with a definition of population health. And here is my definition. So population health, I think, can be defined as the science and art of preventing disease and promoting health through the organised efforts of society, organisations, communities, families and individuals. For those of you familiar with definitions of population health and what it, is, what it used to be called, um, public health, you'll note that this definition is basically the same as that of Charles Edward Winslow, dating back to the 1920s, and also that of the Faculty of Public Health, the standard-setting body for specialists in population health in the United Kingdom. Although, uh, I should say I've modified it a bit. An important thing to note about this definition is that it regards population health as both a science and an art, which suggests that the arts have just as much to contribute to population health as the sciences. By arts, I do mean art, but also literature, myth and history, which I'll, gain, I'll come on to later. 
The definition also makes it clear that when it comes to disease, population health is about prevention rather than cure. And this definition also begs the question of what we mean by disease and health. So here is the World, definition, World, health, Organi whoops, def yeah, the World health Organization's definition of health. It's the, according to them, a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. The word to note here, I think, is social. From this definition, it follows that health is not just something individuals might aspire to, but also groups or populations, i.e. families, organisations, such as this department, communities, and indeed societies. And from this, I think it can be argued that the health of a population is not just the sum of the health states of the individuals within that population. Now, I know it may sound odd to some of you to suggest that groups rather than individuals can be healthy or unhealthy, and even more odd to suggest that the health of a population is not just the sum of the states of health of the individuals of which it is composed. But, but, but for me, these ideas are at the heart, forgive the pun, of population health and distinguishes it from medicine, which might be defined as the science and art of treating and alleviating the disease of individuals. Do we have any evidence to suggest that the health of a group is not just the sum of the health states of the individuals within that group? Well, I think we do in the work of various population health scientists, and most strikingly in the work of Richard Wilkinson and colleagues. So to take just one example, here is a graph of income inequality against infant mortality in, uh, in rich countries. Each point represents a country. The countries with the greatest income inequality, such as the United States, are to the right. The countries with the least income inequality, such as Sweden and Japan, are to the left. It shows that there is a relationship between income inequality and infant mortality, with countries that have the greatest income inequality experiencing the greatest infant mortality mortality. And it's important to note that x and y, the x and y variables on this graph, are not the properties of individuals but of societies. Income inequality can only be measured when you have two people, at least, in relationship with one another. Income inequality can be experienced by an individual, but only when another individual is present. And similarly, but perhaps less obviously, Infant mortality of a country can only be measured when, when there is a group of individuals uh, in which more than one child dies, and the same may be said of any disease rate. So I think the properties of groups and the relationship to health is an important area for future research. Of course, societies are not clear, merely defined by how unequal they are. But this area of research has been hampered, I think, by the notion that there's no such thing as society, as articulated by Margaret Thatcher in a famous interview given to Women's Own in 1987. I didn't meet her. It says, they are costing their problems at society, and you know there's no such thing as society. There are individual men and women, and there are families, and no government could do anything except through people, and people must look after themselves first. It's our duty to look after ourselves and then also to look after our neighbours. I'm going to have some water, sorry. <laughs> well, you ponder on Margaret Thatcher's quote. <laughs> of course, population health does not merely aim to describe the healthiness or, or otherwise of individuals and populations but to do something about what, it is, what is observed. In addition, it's worth emphasising that population health aims to improve the health of groups, societies, communities, organisations, families, and not just individuals. Public health is therefore concerned with both problems and solutions. And incidentally, some of us think that population health research um, spends too much time on the problems and not enough on the solutions. But I don't, um, unfortunately, have enough time to go into that today. So turning again to my definition of population health, another important couple of words 
in this definition are organised efforts. So what are organised efforts? At this point, I can't resist the temptation to show you um, my favourite diagram of the complexity with which population health must deal. So this is a map of the causes and possible solutions of just one public health problem, that is obesity. It was produced by the UK government's foresight programme for the Government Office of Science in 2007. I say favourite, but actually I think it obfuscates rather than it illuminates. <laughs> to me, the solution of obesity um, is simple, as many of you will know. It's to tax sugary drinks. <laughs> <laughs> Although, I do acknowledge uh, that uh, that isn't going to be the only measure necessary. There is no mention of sugary drinks in this map, let alone sugary drinks taxes. <laughs> Given that it came out of a government perhaps, a department, perhaps that's not surprising. The closest you get to that, uh, to get to it, is the uh, market price of food offerings, whatever they are here. Rather strangely, you get a whole section of the map devoted to self-esteem and psychological ambivalence, shown here. There is even a box for genetic and epigenetic predisposition uh, shown here. But I'm not at all sure that knowing that uh, there is a genetic predisposition to obesity, which there probably is, is at all helpful when it comes to generating solutions. A better way, perhaps, I think, or I do think, of explaining the organised efforts necessary to prevent obesity, and indeed the organised efforts are um, necessary to prevent disease and promote health as a whole, um, is a poem called The Fence or The Ambulance by Joseph Mannans, written in 1895, and I'll read it to you. T'was a dangerous cliff, as they freely confessed, though to walk near its crest was so pleasant. But over its terrible edge there had slipped a duke and full many a peasant. So the people said something should have to be done, but their projects, projects did not all tally. Some said, put a fence round the edge of the cliff, some, an ambulance down in the valley. <laughs> but the cry for the ambulance carried the day, for it spread through the neighbouring city. A fence may be useful or not, it is true, but each heart becomes full of pity for those who slipped over the dangerous cliff. And the dwellers in highways and alleys gave pounds and gave pence not to put up a fence, but an ambulance down in the valley. For the cliff is all right if you're careful, they said, and if folks even slip and are dropping. It isn't the slipping that hurts them so much as the shop down below when they're stopping. <laughs> so day after day, as these mishaps occurred, quick forth would they, those rescuers sally to pick up the victims who fell off the cliff with their ambulance down in the valley. Then an old sage remarked, It's a marvel to me that people give far more attention to preparing results than to stopping the cause when they'd much better aim at prevention. Let us stop at the source, all this mischief, cried he. Come, neighbours and friends, let us rally. If a cliff we will fence, we might almost dispense with the ambulance down in the valley. Oh, he's a fanatic, the others rejoined. Dispense with the ambulance? Never. He dispensed with all charities too, if he could. No, no, we'll support them forever. Aren't we picking up faults just as fast as they fall? And shall this man dictate to us, shall he? Why should people of sense stop to put up a fence while the ambulance works in the valley? But the sensible few, who are practical too, will not bear with such nonsense much longer. They believe that prevention is better than cure, and their party will soon be the stronger. Encourage them then with your purse, your voice and your pen, and while other philanthropists dally, they will scorn all pretense and put up a stout fence on the cliff that hangs over the valley. Better guide, with, better guide well the young than reclaim them when old, for the voice of true wisdom is calling. To rescue the fallen is good, but tis best to prevent other people from falling. Better close up the source of temptation and crime than deliver from dungeon or galley. Better put a strong fence around the top of the cliff than an ambulance down in the valley. Which I think, though it was written by a temperance 
um, reformer or campaigner uh, has uh, relevance to us today. But to return to my title, what have God, evolution, global warming and heart disease got to do with, the pro- with population health? I'll take each in turn. The easiest of these topics to deal with is heart disease because it is self-evidently a pop- population health problem. And I'm going to take it as read, uh, at least in this audience, that it can be prevented by um, pr- improving our diets, increasing our levels of physical activity, smoking less and um, reducing our consumption of alcohol. As I said, heart disease is an issue that I've been concerned with since 1986, when I joined the staff of the Coronary Prevention Group. And that year, coronary heart disease was responsible for nearly 200,000 deaths a year in the UK, and we could confidently say that coronary heart disease was Britain's number one killer. In 2012, coronary heart disease was responsible for 74,000 deaths, and now even the British Heart Foundation concedes that cancer is the Britain's number one killer, with nearly 166,000 deaths a year. So can we explain this success story? So here are some slides from a paper I contributed to. Uh, it was published in the British Medical Journal in 2012, and the first author was one of my DPhil students, Kate Smolina. So this first slide shows the decline in deaths from heart attack, the most acute form of coronary heart disease, between 1999 and 2007. And the blue line shows the decline in deaths from heart disease overall. The green line shows deaths from heart disease in hospital, and the red line Um, deaths out of hospital. So the decline in overall deaths has had nothing to do with improving hospital care. Your chances of dying from heart attack if you reach hospital barely changed over that time. So what was happening which led to this rapid decline in people dying from heart disease out of hospital? So this slide, which I'm afraid is a bit complicated, uh, shows that it was two things. The number of actual heart attacks was falling, the event rate is described in this slide. And people were living longer after their heart attack. Case fatality, it's called, was improving. So why was this event rate declining and case fatality improving? And actually, it's about evens. Um, half the decline in mortality was due to the decline in event rate and half was due to the increase or the improvement in case fatality. But why was this uh, um, event rate declining in case fatality? Why was case fatality improving? I still think this question lacks an entirely satisfactory explanation. Um, And uh, this is, I think, a really good area for future research. My friend Simon Capewell has tackled it, but I don't think he or anyone else as yet has given us the full picture. What we can say um, is that it wasn't just down to the increasing use of statins and other drugs that reduce your risk of heart attack. Here's a slide I borrowed or stolen from Richard Pito, um, who teaches on one of our courses. It shows that the decline in vascular mortality as a whole, i.e. deaths from both heart attacks and strokes, for the past 50 years in this case. And here's the date of the publication of the first major study showing the effectiveness of statins as a drug that reduces your level of blood cholesterol and thereby your risk of vascular disease. You can see that this trial was published long after the decline in vascular mortality began. Here is the Daily Mail's um, explanation of our results published in the British Medical Journal that um, that year. For once, I think they got it uh, a bit right, but we didn't actually say this in our paper. The headline was, for those of you who can't read it, heart attack deaths halve in eight years due to fewer smokers, better diet and improvements to care. We have come a long way, I think, um, in the past 30 years in our understanding of the causes of the remedies for heart and, the, and the remedies for heart disease, as, as illustrated by this billboard advert from 1994, just after I left the Coronary Prevention Group to uh, start what has become the British Heart Foundation Centre for Non-Communicable Disease Prevention here in the department. The advertising campaign used um, statistics from a compendium of statistics on heart disease, um, which Rory mentioned, um, we produced, we, the, we, that's my centre, has been producing that for the past 20 years. But it's inconceivable, I think, that the British Heart Foundation would use this slogan, cross your heart and hope not to die, nowadays. 
How we explain things brings me to the next issue in my title, uh, God, or rather theology. But firstly, I want to say um, something about other ologies besides theology and their contribution to population health. I think we suffer from a limited understanding of what counts as an explanation. Scientific explanations are not the only sorts of explanations we need to help us live our lives. And a framework for thinking about different types of explanations is provided by the philosopher Ken Wilber um, from his theory of everything. Wilber divides theories into four types, individual objective, group objective, group subjective, and individual objective. Perhaps an easier way of understanding this classification scheme is to show how different disciplines or ologies can be classified by this framework. So physiological theories are archetypical individual objective theories, according to the scheme, aiming objectively to study individual bodies. Monday psychological theories are generally the individual objective type, though in the past they were more subjective. Think Freud. Epidemiology is the discipline that is most associated with population health. It too seeks objectively to study individuals, in particular their health status, but as I've suggested earlier, some, it sometimes seeks objectively to study the health of groups. And indeed, in my opinion, it should do more of that. In this, it touches upon group objective theories, such as those generated by sociology. Sociology is a discipline that seeks to explain largely objectively, at least almost everywhere except France, the characteristics of groups, and in particular, societies. So in the two right-hand uh, quadrants, we find disciplines that primarily rely on objective knowledge and on empirical data, preferably quantified and from, preferably, again, from experiments. In the two left-hand quadrants, we have disciplines that rely primarily on subjective understanding and on story rather than on numbers. Theology, top left, with which, with, with, within which I would include atheistic theologies, if that isn't a contradiction in terms, as well as theistic theologies, generate the archetypical individual subjective type of theory. But there are also theories which can described as group subjective theories, such as historical theories, bottom left. Theology is generally thought of seeking to explain the individual subjective experience of their place in nature, his or her relationship with others, including, and including God, etc., but it is uh, it, like epidemiology, I think, sh should be a bit more concerned with the collective experience. Of course, this classification of ologies is hugely simplistic, and many of you will object to where I put your favourite ology, or ick, ick as they're used these days, like genomics. So how does all this relate to the problem of heart disease? Well, firstly, different types of theories to explain the problem, in actual fact, seek to address superficially similar but actually very different questions. For example, in relationship to heart disease, individual objective theories might address the question, why does he, she, or even it have heart disease? Group objective theories, why do they as a group have heart disease? Group subjective theories, why do we as a group have heart disease? And individual subjective theories, why do I have heart disease? Physiology tells us... Oops. Physiology tells us how heart disease is the result of cholesterol-laden plaque building up in arteries, sometimes breaking away to form a clot. And that block clot will, as you know, block or may block a coronary artery, bringing oxygen to the heart. Epidemiology gives us some answers to the question of why heart disease is more prevalent in certain groups rather than in others. And incidentally, these are some results published only the other day um, but similar to those I showed you earlier about income inequality and infant mortality. History explains how we as a society, such as that of the UK, have become defined by our patterns of consumption, many of which turn out to be bad for us. For example, our tendency to overconsume high sugar foods, leading to overweight and obesity and in turn to heart disease. Theology seeks to explain why human beings suffer, suffer from diseases such as heart disease. And in Christian theology, the reasons for suffering are addressed, but perhaps not answered, in the book of Job and in the sayings of Jesus. 
and sayings and stories of Jesus, both his parables and his and the narrative of his life. Different ologies bring different answers to the problem of problem of heart disease, but also propose different solutions. So physiology uh, suggests tackling the build-up of cholesterol in arterial plaque through dietary change or pharmacological treatment. Epidemiology suggests that policies which affect income distribution may have the additional benefit of reducing overall rates of heart disease. There's a picture of students celebrating the fact that the University of Oxford has signed up to being a living wage employer, which I think is a great step forward. History suggests that we need to tackle the overconsumption of particular consumer goods, such as sugary drinks. They were, for example, increasing their price. Uh, this is a billboard urging people in Barclay, California, to vote for a sugary drinks tax, which, in fact, they did. Theology tells us the importance of eating together, and if we do, we will lead happier and healthier lives. To cut a rather long story short... Now, these ologies are, I contend, complementary, not competitive, in both their analysis of problems and their generation of solutions. But it is one reason why I think the Nuffield Department of Population Health at the University of Oxford needs more than just epidemiologists, but also psychologists and sociologists, as being researchers in neighbouring um, ologies in my conceptual framework, and dare I say it, a few theologians. <laughs> So that was God, or at least theology. What about evolution and global warming? I've rather run out of time to talk about those, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> but I'll briefly say something about them. Firstly, evolution, or rather evolutionary biology. I mentioned earlier that the, that particular theory of evolution that was summarised in Richard Dawkins's book published in 1973, or did I... That theory is called neo-Darwinism, and its forerunner, Darwinism, has, I think, had a profound effect on our thinking in all disciplines, not just theology, and not just biology, I mean. Uh, the influence of Darwinism on other disciplines, including psychology, sociology, economics, and, of course, theology, is brilliantly laid out in this book, which I commend to, re to, commend to you. I think it's, uh, it's my favourite book on, on evolution, really. It's entitled Darwin's Metaphor, and it's by a guy called Robert Young, who turns out to be still alive. I sent him a, an email yesterday to find out if he was, and he had, had you replied. <laughs> and uh, there's a quote in it. This is one of many good quotes in this book. Uh, Science is social activity, born of society, mediating structures and values, at least as much as it is born of nature. A particular effect of neo-Darwinism... Um, on our ideas and um, relevant to my personal perspective on population health is, I think, its influence on our ideas about the nature of society and whether they might be described as healthy, irrespective, at least to some degree, of the health of the individuals of which they are composed. You'll remember Margaret Thatcher said that there is no such thing as society. And in my mind, and in an extraordinary interview with Eddie Mayer on Radio 4's IPM programme in April 2. 2013, Ian Swingland, now Emeritus Professor in Conservation <coughs> Biology at the University of Kent, says, Thatcher eschewed the idea of society because of a high-table dinner at Magdalen College in Oxford in March 1978. At this dinner, Richard Dawkins convinced her there was no such thing as society, just individuals. Swingland himself uh, attended that dinner. Whether it's true or not, I don't I'm not entirely sure, but I'm, wait, I'm looking for, uh, waiting for Richard Dawkins' second um, volume of his autobiography to see what he says about that dinner. Uh, actually, here's a transcript, transcript of that interview, but I'm not going to read it now. And secondly, global warming. And I don't have a slide for global warming. Now, anthropogenic uh, global warming is a problem which I think is similar to heart disease. It, like heart disease threatens our physical, mental and societal well-being, our health in other words. And to be concerned, I think, about human health and not about the health of the planet seems increasingly absurd, given that if the pr predictions of, of those who are tackling climate change or tracking climate change rather, are correct, human health will in the future 
be profoundly affected by global warming. Anthropogenic global warming, like heart disease, can be explained in various ways and will require different types of solution. But explanations for and solutions to global warming seem extraordinarily similar to those for heart disease. We would reduce our risk of heart disease and save on fossil fuels if we ate more plant-based foods and less meat and walked and cycled rather than travelling by car. And moreover, like population health problems, global warming will only be solved through the organised efforts of society, organisations, communities, families and individuals. So finally, I would like to close with some words of a hymn, which, I, or which we sung, rather, in um, my church yesterday. And they seem peculiarly apt to what I've been saying. I've got the words of that hymn. I'm not going to get you to sing it. <laughs> Spirit of truth, arise. Inspire the prophet's voice. Expose the scorn, the tyrant's lies, and bid the poor rejoice. O Spirit, clear our sight. All prejudice remove. And help us to discern the right and covet only love. Give us the tongues to speak, the words of love and grace, to rich and poor, to strong and weak, in every time and place. Enable us to hear the words that others bring, interpreting with open ear the special song they sing. So I know I said that I would only give two acknowledgements in this lecture, but I have a few more. Well, not many more. Thank you all very much for coming and for, and for listening, as they say. And also thank you too to Charlotte Payne for providing some sushi made with edible insects to eat as snacks after this lecture. I'll leave it up to you to work out the connection between insect sushi and God, evolution, global warming, heart disease, and indeed population health. And indeed there is a connection, or lots of connections. Thank you.